Hi, good afternoon. I just would like to welcome uh, everyone for taking time out of your day to join us here at AI for a webinar on a blueprint for back to school. Uh, I am so excited to have with us today, Candice McQueen, Joanne Weiss, and Wayne Lewis, who are part of uh, an esteemed panel that helped to put together this blueprint. And what we're gonna do is spend a little bit of time just going over the blueprint. Uh, and then we're going to jump into a Q&A uh, with this great panel. And then we're going to turn it over to you for some questions. Uh, but first, I want to just do a couple different housekeeping uh, items. And to do that, I'm going to just share my screen. Hang on one second. Great. So first of all, uh, if you need a copy of the Blueprint, uh, you can go to www.aei.org. Uh, you can also use uh, your scanner, your phone uh, camera, and take a picture of the QR code there. It'll take you right uh, to the page for it. So feel free to visit it, download uh, the Blueprint. Uh, also, uh, for the panel portion, we're going to have a, a couple of questions and a dialogue. But we're also going to be inviting you to ask some questions as well. To do that, uh, what we ask is that you email your questions to matthew.rice at aei.org, or you can tweet them uh, with just the hashtag, uh, hashtag getting back to school. And uh, that way we'll be able to fold your questions in and hopefully be able to respond to you. Um, what I wanna do is just quickly uh, set the table, go through a little bit of the report. Um, first of all, it is an amazing group uh, that has come together to help develop this report. I'm not going to read every single name here, but what you need to know is that it is former federal officials uh, from the Clinton administration, Bush administration, and Obama administration. Uh, we have state chiefs. Uh, we have uh, school leaders, both superintendents of public schools as well as charter school leaders, people across the political spectrum, uh, over 19 different thought leaders uh, that helped shape and inform this report. So. It is very much a consensus document and in, in, in the spirit helping us sort of lay out what some of the roadmap might look like going forward. Um, we base this report on four different assumptions. First of all, as you've seen across the country, not only have schools closed, but they're closed for the rest of the academic uh, school year. But also based on what Dr. Tony Fauci is saying and other public health experts, we do expect uh, that with the gradual relaxation of social distancing measure, the schools are going to be able to open uh, the next school year. There's gonna to have to be a couple different uh, accommodations because of health protocols, but we do think they'll be able to open. However, we do expect, uh, based on what public health guidance is saying, is that there's gonna be additional waves of this virus. Some will be re rebound waves, some will be a second or third wave. And so as a result, schools may have to close, again, for periods of 14 or 28 days. And, as a result, this remote learning that we've all been thrust into over the last couple of months may have to be triggered once again in a local rolling uh, local basis uh, over the next academic year. Uh, second, reopen schools will need important modifications uh, that are going to be developed by public health experts. So again, having to listen to the CDC and state and local and county public health officials are going to tell us what are need changes are going to be needed inside of physically with schools everything from physical distancing protocols. We may have to do temperature screenings before students are allowed into a building and also just the frequent disinfecting that's gonna to have to happen for school buses and classrooms and hallways. Um, we also believe that there's gonna to have to be important accommodations for teachers, administrators and school staff who may be at heightened risk for COVID due to their age. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's a whole set of population of uh, school personnel who because of their age or because of underlying health circumstances, it may be too risky for them to come back to school into the physical thing. And so we have to think a little bit about how do we uh, use those teachers in new ways? Uh, and also how do we backfill some of those positions there too? And then finally, a vaccine, based on what Tony Fauci is saying and other medical researchers is that a vaccine is probably at a minimum 18 months away, it could be even longer. And so if you think about that in terms of education uh, perspective, that's not just this upcoming academic year, but that gets us a little bit into the falling academic year. And so if you think that this roadmap and what schools and states need to be thinking about now is not just about how to make these accommodations for this coming school year, but also make sure that they're in place for uh, the following school year as well. 
uh, some guiding principles. One, I mean, we just believe that again, governors have the authority to open and close schools, and uh, which is super important, just given their roles in overseeing everything in terms of the social distancing measures uh, that we're seeing put in place right now. Uh, but they should do that in close consultation with school officials. Um, second, schools are responsible for meeting the needs of all students, uh, including the distinctive needs of students from low-income backgrounds, students with disabilities, and English language learners. We saw in this case, uh, in the last couple of months, a couple schools that were just saying that because they couldn't educate all students, uh, they weren't gonna educate uh, or provide remote instruction for any student. And again, we think it's really important to make sure that the plans uh, focus on it, making sure that there's particular accommodations for these students. Um, and again, schools are obliged to find ways to serve all students, even during times of disruption when remote learning uh, requires students to connect from home. And then finally, given that school systems cannot, there's no way that schools could have reasonably been expected to have budgeted for all these additional new costs that they're going to be facing. So we think there's roles for the state uh, government, but also federal government to help provide the budget resources necessary to help schools weather this crisis and to make sure they have all the safety precautions put in place. A um, couple other different, uh, uh, one other uh, aspect of the, this roadmap is that we're seeing some conversations that are just talking uh, about schools opening and closing in a vacuum of the broader conversations about relaxation or the uh, reinstitution of various types of social distancing measure. We think it's really important to anchor any conversation about school opening and closure to the public health frameworks uh, that are opening. And these are just a few. Uh, one for, that came from AI, Johns Hopkins has released one, uh, NGA and the governors just released one as well. But all of these outline phases for a gradual relaxation of social distancing measures, as well as the health triggers for when those uh, social distancing measures should be reactivated. And so any conversation about reopening of schools has to be anchored in these uh, type of public health frameworks, because that's what's going to guide uh, so much of the decisions that we have to make. So let's get into the six different categories. Uh, one is just general considerations that schools and states have to make. It's going to be a need for a ton of community coordination. And this is uh, from states down to school districts, school districts with their community. We're really encouraging governors to consider the same way they've launched a task force for reopening their economy, doing the same thing for reopening schools. Clear communication, so much regulatory flexibility as you've seen states needing regulatory flexibility from the federal government. Schools are gonna need regulatory flexibility from states on any issues with procurement and class size and a whole list of other things. And then also privacy protection. So important to make sure that in this day and age of using remote learning and digital resources that we're doubling down on protecting student privacy, but we're also providing clarity about how various types of privacy provisions and laws impact uh, what schools can do with information sharing uh, and also the work that they're doing to serve uh, students. Um, also, uh, school operations is another category, and this is just all the different accommodations the schools are going to have to make physically to classrooms. Uh, they're going to have to probably limit on campus visitors, possibly do temperature checks, cleaning hallways, classrooms, more frequent hand washing for students. Uh, I put a picture on the right there of this is a school in Germany that's measuring out that six feet. And again, that's probably going to be a practice we're going to see being used here in the United States uh, when we go back to school. School meals, uh, again, schools have been doing some heroic work in terms of trying to make sure that any kid that needs uh, a lunch is able to get a lunch and a breakfast, sometimes using buses to transport those meals out to where they're located. It's going to have to be a conversation about continuing that practice or what's the best way of setting up cafeterias uh, in the school. And then also transportation. There's going to be such an interesting demand on the way we use buses, including if we have to go to staggered schedules and where some of the students come in in the morning and some go in the afternoon. All those are going to need complex scheduling uh, for school buses as well as uh, additional budget support. Whole child support. We know that not every single student is uh, experiencing COVID in the same way, and that some students are going through very traumatic experiences right now. It's from losing friends and families to the disease. It is because of the loneliness and isolation. It's because of the insecurity that's come from a parent losing their job. And so one of the first steps the school's going to have to do is think about SEL and uh, supports and how to make sure that we're assessing what those students need and uh, making sure 
uh, that we're meeting them. School personnel, as I mentioned, uh, again, huge susceptible population. We are estimating 18% of all teachers, 20%, 7% of principals who are considered vulnerable because they're in that age group of over 55. Uh, and so states and schools are gonna have to think a lot about uh, ways of using them in new ways, whether it's online teaching or whether it's early retirement incentives. That's a huge population that we're gonna have to take care of as well as backfill in terms of other roles. Collective bargaining agreements, it's a great chance for unions and state leaders as well as superintendents to come together and develop frameworks. We've seen this with Governor Newsom out in California. Other states should follow suit and union leaders should be leading on the charge in this too. And then other staffing challenges as well, especially in the light of declining state budgets. Uh, schools are gonna have to think about ways of trying to stretch those dollars and revisiting staff projections going forward. Academics, every school is gonna need a continuity of learning plan, which is making sure they're engaging their curriculum providers, trying to assess how their curriculum, uh, how the curriculum provider can be used for diagnostic purposes, uh, but also the different ways that that curriculum could be used in the classroom, uh, online during remote learning or some sort of hybrid approach. And so great, important conversation for schools to have with their curriculum providers right now. Students with special needs in ELL will need special accommodations and support. Uh, and then again, thinking about schedules and learning time, uh, so much challenges here, especially if we're going to have to go to staggered schedules. We have to think creatively, too, about extending the learning day and extending the learning year. And maybe some of that is by uh, extending the learning day by a couple hours. But it could also be where students come to school for part of the day and then they're learning remotely for the other part of the day. So lots of uh, uh, opportunities there. Uh, assessing students' needs. States and schools are going to have to consider screening student needs for SEL, mental health, and other, especially during this period of uh, summer learning loss and uh, just all the other challenges students have faced. Um, we should also be thinking about making sure that uh, states commit now to administering their 2021 spring assessments. It is so important uh, to make sure those assessments are in place uh, not only to help calculate and assess growth and to also get a sense of uh, where students are relative to, to standards, but it is the way that we help identify and target additional resources to the students in the schools that need more help. Uh, but this is also a remarkable opportunity to try some new types of assessments, whether it's competency-based, uh, through course assessments, uh, but it is a chance to uh, help adopt a model that is rewarding uh, not just seat time, uh, but students uh, for their competency. And so awesome, amazing opportunity to experiment with that. And then finally, distance learning. Uh, as we've seen, uh, there's just too many students who lack home, uh, connectivity at home and a device at home uh, to participate in any type of remote learning. And so we're calling uh, on the federal government to make sure that uh, by the beginning of the school year, every single student has a device and the connectivity they need for remote learning. Uh, in the past, if you were shut out of uh, online homework or online tutors, like that was sort of optional. It was nice to have, but now it's fundamental that if you don't have a connectivity, uh, if you don't have the connectivity in a device, you are just don't have access to your teacher, instruction, or any sort of learning. And then finally, professional development and just doubling down and investing in our teachers to make sure they have the skills and the knowledge and the services and the tools to do remote learning uh, successfully, effectively, uh, and most importantly, in a way that serves uh, students. And so with that, I am gonna turn it over uh, to our great panel uh, with Joanne, Candice, and Wayne. Let me just stop sharing my screen. And um, I just wanna thank all of you for joining us. And um, uh, let's go right to a question, Joanne. Help set the table for us. Uh, what is it that uh, schools should be thinking about um, as a result of the, like, just what is the environment that schools need to be thinking about this work? Yeah, so I think you did a great job, John, of painting the picture of the incredible complexity that, that districts are gonna be facing when they walk back in the door in September. Um, I think to me, one of the hardest things is, I think we've been thinking about these scenarios of coming back to school as being like school reopens, kids are in school, how do we do social distancing, how do we hand wash, disinfect, how do we take care of all of those sort of physical questions. But I think there's, as you pointed out, going to be tremendous uncertainty around the questions of who's in the building, who's not in the building, how as teachers do we accommodate at the same time 
you know, 15 of my kids are in the building. Five of my kids are in homes where either the child themselves or some close family member is at risk. And so that kid is being kept at home, but is still totally able to learn. And the teacher has to kind of wrap their arms around this brand new kind of hybrid setting and figure out how to teach in that environment. Meanwhile, in the community, everybody's kind of taken two steps out of, uh, out of uh, stay at home lockdown and it worked, great. People have taken three more steps out, it worked and then it didn't work. And now we're back on lockdown for a little while and suddenly my whole class is remote. And we saw in the spring what it did and the disruption that it caused to move just from the like in-person to the remote scenario. Now we're gonna have to manage that going on and schools probably being in multiple scenarios over the course of the school year and kind of moving in and out of these in a smooth, less disruptive way in order to keep learning going for the school year. And that's a tall order to prepare for against the backdrop that you painted of all the other things that districts have to get their arms around. Yeah. Yeah. It's so difficult without knowing, I mean, like, we have schools that can prepare for some disruptions, like schools know it's hurricane season, but this is one where they have to prepare uh, against without any sort of forecast necessarily. It's a great point. Candace, uh, I mean, Wayne, let's go to both of you, but we'll start with Candace. Like, I mean, you, you both have had worn different hats in the past. You've been classroom teachers, you've led state uh, departments of education. I mean, with less than five months uh, before the beginning of the academic year, or close to four months now, I mean, how should we use that time for schools to prepare? Yeah, I think both of you have set this great picture of the challenges in front of us. It's the time to step back during the month of May and analyze what has gone well, what really didn't go well. Um, how do we put point people inside our school districts or even in state departments to actually say, you now need to help us figure this out. Um, part of this is we, we moved so quickly to remote learning that we weren't able to step back and say, what does success look like in remote learning? Where should we even start? And so we jumped to an LMS, we jumped to a tool, uh, we jumped to no grading, we jumped to very little feedback without stepping back and saying, well, how can we make this successful and what should be those priorities and actually starting with the content, right? What's the standard? What's the curriculum? What are we trying to achieve? And then what are the right tools that actually would help us get there? So we got to step back and analyze what went well, what didn't, and how do we create a pathway where we can start engaging in grading and feedback in a much deeper way in the virtual environment, as well as, as Joanne said, in a potential hybrid or intermittent environment where we're going back and forth with multiple groups between a physical location and a virtual location. The other thing is just to get those systems right for food services, food delivery, all the things that we took a lot of time on, rightly so, we need to have those as automatic. And so when we're moving into the fall, we have released that in an automatic way. You've got the right point people in place and that we are focused on working with student groups and the academics to get kids caught up and also to move seamlessly into, um, as much as we can, into the fall with that support that students are going to need. That's a great point. But Wayne, what are, what are some of your thoughts? I think Candace and Joanne are spot on, John. You know, um, we moved incredibly quickly from um, you know life as we know it where kids are coming to school every day and we're providing them with services on the ground to remote learning and and I think we, we have to say um, every time we begin this conversation that we do we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to our educators and educational leaders who at the snap of a finger truly made that happen right in the, in the, the course of a week or two, transitioned everything that they've known, everything that they've done over the course of their career to now serving kids who are not coming to school. So we'll, we'll forever owe a debt of gratitude to those folks. Now, with that said, we're in the place now where, as Candace said, we get to step back and do some assessment and, and understand, right, recognize that we did not, in many cases, have the training or the infrastructure that we'd like to have in order to make that type of transition. So in many cases, we've asked schools and teachers and leaders to do something that they've not had training or background to do. And so now is the time for us to provide the type of training, 
to provide the types of resources that they need to be able to do that um, well, to be able to serve our kids the way we know we have the potential to serve them. And then also for districts to do an assessment of personnel and infrastructure and understand what their needs are. Because if we're gonna do remote learning well, there are some things that we need to put in place, people we need to put in place that we didn't necessarily have um, or need um, prior to making this transition. I mean, a question for, for all of you, but um, you know, I, I know uh, from my experience working in state government and also uh, in, in different federal roles, the one thing schools crave is certainty. Certainty, especially as it comes from guidance, right? Like they wanna know that these are the rules of the road for how the funds are spent or how to apply for a grant and not that they're gonna be changed three months or four months from now. And now all of a sudden we found found ourselves in this situation where the guidance could change, that we have to start doing plans now where medical guidance could change over the next four months based on lessons learned from Europe, where they're opening up schools right now, based on a better under deeper understanding of COVID-19 as a, as a virus and as a disease. So what, what would be your recommendations for how schools should plan given that uncertainty uh, in terms of everything that can impact their operations and modifications? Um, but Candace, let's start with you and go to Wayne and then finish with Joanne on that question. Yeah, I, I was just reading an article about Denmark. Denmark has opened up their um, schools primarily for elementary school students, and it has had a lot of anxiety ridden parents um, concerned about it. And so some parents have pulled their kids out after they've opened, and now they've got some attendance challenges. So I, I think we can see from some of our international neighbors what happens when you start entering into this space. So the first thing to do is start with what are we trying to accomplish? And I, I think that has been the, the hardest about the spring is you had to jump to something that was about health and safety. We have a pandemic, we're having to jump to something we might not have otherwise had to jump into on a different day and a different time. So now we're stepping back and saying, right, what do we wanna accomplish in the fall? And what is in front of us and start with who are our students? What do we know about them? How did we actually do during the spring? Did they learn? Did they not? How do we know? Were we grading? Were we giving feedback? Were we assessing? Were we not? Um, how did parents feel? Survey them. Actually find out what did they feel like was strong or not about what happened during the spring, depending on what you did. And then go to what do we want to accomplish? What does success look like for the fall? What are our standards? What's our curriculum? Let's start there and determine what assessment tool, what diagnostic tool, what version of our spring assessment could we bring in into the fall that would allow us to hit the ground running on at least determining what those gaps are and having a, a plan, a co-requisite plan, if you will, on what were those key standards and focus areas from the spring that we need to hit all year long, as well as how do we catch them up on what the expectations are for next year. That's job one. I think it's the second thing we, we, we definitely need to do is to step back and say, how can we actually create some equity? Um, this was our challenge in the spring and it is not fixed. Um, and this is going to take money. It's going to take time. It's going to take people standing up and saying, when students don't have access to anything digital in their home, whether it's about connectivity, broadband access, if we're talking generally about devices, then what we're talking about just does not work effectively for the students who need it the most. And so this is something we have to figure out now. And I'm so proud to look across the country at how many superintendents have stepped up, um, local communities have stepped up, corporations that have stepped up to say, we wanna to try to fill that divide. But if we can't fix that over the next few months, we're going to be struggling again going into the fall because there will be some version of virtual continuing to happen through next year. Yeah, it's a great point that, I mean, this, uh, I mean, COVID has uh, illuminated so many of the equity gaps that I think many of us knew were there, not as many in the public necessarily, but now it's made it impossible to ignore it for two for going forward. So great points. Wayne, what, what sort of advice would you have for schools? I pick up right, right where Candace left off. Um, in, in saying that the only thing I think that's certain right now is that we're not certain. Um, and I think it's important to say that because as educators and educational leaders, I think we need to first be able to wrap our heads around the reality that we don't exactly know what it's going to look like. 
I think we need to train in that regard. And I think we need to prepare for some different contingencies. Now, as I think about what the possibilities are, going back to, to, to one of Candace's points, there's only a couple possible um, ways that this can go. Either we're gonna start the school year um, as we, we were in February, in January of this year, where everybody's coming back to school and everybody's on the ground, or we're gonna start the school year um, using remote learning, or there's gonna be some combination in between, right? So maybe we start the school year you, and, and we transition to remote learning. Maybe we start with remote learning and then we transition to kids coming, uh, coming to, to, to physical buildings. It, it's going to be one of those, one, one combination of, of one of those scenarios. I think we have to do some planning for all of them. The other thing I think leaders and educators have to keep in mind is that it, they're not responsible. They shouldn't be responsible for doing everything on their own. One of the, the things that, um, that I think we, we haven't always thought about, depending on the district, is as you transition to something like remote learning or using distance learning, it is not the expectation, it should not be the expectation that uh, teacher A takes his or her curriculum and has complete responsibility and expectation that they are um, shifting everything online, um, using instructional design principles. Um, there, there are lots of vendors, there are lots of companies, there are lots of other school districts out there that have been doing remote learning, that have been doing um, distance learning for quite some time that we can lean to. Everything doesn't have to be created from scratch. And this is a, a really great opportunity for us to talk with our partners, talk with our colleagues, not just across the state, but across the country and bring in what some of those effective practices and tools have been to move the needle for kids. This is not just about getting back to where we left off. But I think this is an opportunity as well to incorporate some things that can potentially move us fur even further in terms of student learning. Great points. Love that. Joanne. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just going to sort of plus one everything that Candace and Wayne said and, and maybe just kind of put a bow around it by saying there's something that the military came up with, a term that the military coined, I think, like during the Cold War, that's VUCA, which is... What do you do when you're doing strategic planning in a time when it's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous? And if that doesn't define the time we're in, I don't know what does. And the answer to it, as Wayne said, is scenario planning. Like you have to know, as Candace said, what you're trying to accomplish for whom, but the how is going to be scenario-based because you're not sure which of the scenarios you're going to be in at what time. And the only way to give yourself some level of confidence and understanding about how to effectively move among the scenarios is to think them through ahead of time. And I agree with Wayne, there's like three of them. There's not a million, but there's not one. And so that's the work that needs to be done between now and the fall. Joanne, I just wanna pick up something that Wayne said about, you know, it's a great point about us we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We can have conversations with other schools and with providers that have done this well. But also, I know when we were working on the report, you were you especially were talking about this this notion of schools have curriculum providers. Some of them are online, some are uh, analog. But there needs to be a conversation with them uh, right now. What t dig a little bit deeper into that? Like, what elaborate more on what that conversation should look like? Yeah, I totally agree with what Wayne was saying. Like there are a few things right now that I think people need to understand um, in order to take this conversation from the like 40,000 foot level that blueprints operate at down to the ground so that it's actually actionable. And for teachers, that means how do I teach my curriculum? Not generically, how do I teach math, but how do I teach? I've got a curriculum, how do I use it best? And there's a few questions that are unique to this moment in time that they need help answering. Like what's the highest priority content for this grade level and all the prerequisites that need to be in place that I need to check in order to make sure kids are prepared for this grade level. Not everything, like what's the most important stuff and the most important prerequisites? How do I know? How do I, can I diagnose? How do I know what kids know and what they don't know? And then how do I use these materials in person and remotely in a way that maintains instructional coherence for all of my kids and allows me as a teacher to monitor progress, see where kids are and do it smoothly. So 
there's no reason that curriculum providers can't lean in and help answer those questions for their curriculum and help their customers by doing uh, online or Zoom-based professional learning for their teachers that says, so all of you are using this stuff. Here's the answer to some of these guidance questions. Now you can take it and customize it because you know your kids best, but here's a starting point for how to do this work. We really need to be in it together and be in it where the rubber meets the road on the ground with the materials teachers need to use every day to help their kids move forward. That's great. I got one question for each of you, then we're going to go to audience questions. And uh, for those of you who are watching uh, online, just want to remind you that if you have a question, uh, email uh, matthew.rice at aei.org, matthew.rice at aei.org, or you can tweet it with a hashtag, uh, getting back to school, getting back to school. So uh, we'll do that and we'll take your questions. But first, um, we ended uh, the blueprint on a bit of an optimistic note. I know talking about this just feels overwhelming because of the challenges, the uncertainties, and just the obstacles to getting schools reopened. But we ended on, uh, on a bit of an optimistic note and on a, on a hope that this is a chance to not go back to normal necessarily because normal really wasn't serving a bunch of kids really well. N normal was hiding some of the inequities and some of the gaps that Candace was, uh, was mentioning. And this is a chance to go to something better. And so I just want to ask each of you, and we'll start with Wayne and then go to Candace and then with Joanne, but what do you hope will come out of this? All this planning, all this work, all this new investment, how do we use this not just to put together an emergency plan, but to put together a better form of school and instruction? So what, what, are, what are your hopes? And we'll start with Wayne and then we'll go to Candace and we'll finish with Joanne. I think it's a great question, John, and, and one that I hope we don't, don't lose sight of. Um, the reality for us, and we've said this before, is that this um, situation has highlighted for us really long-standing inequities in our system that, that truthfully we should have been addressing long before. Technology has afforded us the opportunity to revolutionize industry after industry, sector after sector, and do things in those sectors, in those industries that we previously weren't able to do. The technology has been in place for us to, to better serve kids, even with kids coming to school every day, that technology has been in place for some time. But we've been more resistant as a public education system to embrace many of those technologies than I believe we should have. So as we, as we, we strive to provide our kids with safe, um, not just physically safe, but social and emotionally safe experiences, my prayer is that we also embrace the learning technologies that are there. We're not even talking about technologies that, that have to be invented. We're talking about learning technologies that have been there for some time, that we embrace these and make these not just um, kind of temporary stop gaps, but we, we use that technology um, to improve the quality of assessment, the quality of instruction, the, the, the quality of diagnosis that we can provide for kids to, to move education forward for them. Awesome. Candace. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. And I, I would add to that what we did or, or are doing, quite frankly, this spring is not virtual learning at its best. Now, some places may have fantastic um, uh, virtual learning already in place because they've been doing it a while, but, but I would say across the country, what we're doing is not our best. And so we've got to step back and think about what that, that normal that we don't, uh, we're not satisfied with. And I loved what Joanne said, you know, this, we're in this volatile, ambiguous time. Let's don't go back to what we're not satisfied with. Let's actually take advantage of it. Um, and try to think through some things differently. While, by the way, you still have to do the work every day, right? So you're trying to think big. You're trying to also think about the operational work of the day. Take those two things together and say, how could I do both of those? And part of that is how do we individualize learning for students? And we're going to have to do a lot more of that as we go into this next year, um, thinking about groups of students and their their needs and how do we step back and potentially think about that intervention, remediation, whatever you wanna call it, acceleration, enrichment differently and how might technology have helped that 
long ago and how might it going forward? And I would say at the same time, we used to debate this. I know Wayne can appreciate it. We, we worked in Kentucky and Tennessee that um, is technology now, devices or broadband access, is that now like the telephone used to be? And it's just the way we should be operating and people need that to actually maintain the work that they do every day. And if they don't, they're getting farther and farther behind. They can't access certain knowledge that other people have. I think we need to confront that question. Our, our normal going forward should actually create the, the desire, the need, the budgetary pathway where we can have access to technology for everyone, just like the telephone is now. Love that, Joanna. I have like two more uh, slightly different uh, answers to the two answers around both the, the technology and the inequities, which I think are huge takeaways from all of this. One is parents. Parents have, shall we say, a renewed and probably desperately heightened appreciation of teachers and teaching having uh, been subject to being the home teacher for their children for several months now. Well, it seems like several months, several weeks now. Um, but parents as partners going forward in their children's education, I think could take a very different, could, could look very different going forward based on the experience that parents have had in getting involved in their kids' education. And the combination of parents and teachers together could be incredibly powerful if we can figure out how to harness it going forward. And another hopeful thing I think is that over the next few months, we are gonna have more experiments than I think we've ever had with different ways of teaming teachers because we're gonna have teachers who need to work from home. We're gonna have teachers who are at school and we're gonna have teachers who are supporting kids who are both in front of them and at home. And I think it's gonna create a different way of organizing teachers into teams with different kinds of differentiation and specialties and expertise. And I have a feeling that we're gonna learn so much from doing that, that we may not go back to the old traditional ways of organizing our teaching staff when all of this is done. So those are two other things that I'm, that I'm gonna be keeping a close eye on. That's great, love it. Uh, we have some really great questions coming in. Uh, Victoria B asks, what role do parents have during the crisis? How can school districts and school leaders and philanthropy best support parents in this time? Which is a great question. Who wants to take that one? I'll start, uh, you know, as a parent who is um, working with two students right now, a middle schooler and a high schooler, um, as they are moving through remote learning, it has been a, a learning experience for all of us. Um, I've said I look like, you know, a, an angry person one day because I didn't even understand what was happening uh, with the expectations. And then the next day, I'm like, wow, this is the best thing ever. I love, I love the involvement. I love being able to see what you're doing. So I do think there's been a gamut of emotions depending on what the teacher is asking the student to do and how maybe engaged the student is in that. Um, you know, for parents, I think the, the clarity on what the expectations are has made all the difference in the world. When, when a, a student knows exactly, to my earlier point, what does success look like? What are the expectations? What's a model? How do I get there? Then this is much easier both for the student and for the parent to then have clarity around how am I going to do that, right? If I know what this final product should look like or what this modeling um, actually is leading toward. And I do think parents have been somewhat kept in the dark depending on how well remote learning is going where they don't know what the expectations. Am I supposed to be involved? Am I not supposed to be involved? What does success look like? Where might I help? Where should I not help at all? So I think clarity would could matter a lot to parents. And then I would piggyback on something Joanne said this idea that parents' engagement in learning, I think for in good ways has helped parents see what, what challenges are there that my student might be facing that I would not have necessarily seen uh, when they were only in a physical setting. Uh, now you're actually seeing, well, yeah, my, my child does have challenges there that I should be more engaged in or my child really can do that on his or her own and I shouldn't have been as involved. So these are all things that around the clarity for parents, how parents can engage, that we can do a better job moving into the fall uh, by providing a more of a guidance, a pathway, more communication directly to parents about how they engage and when they engage and maybe how they shouldn't engage. John, just a, a quick thought on, on parents. I, I think it's critical as well that parents the expectation for parents not become that they become teachers, 
That's right. Right. Parents, parents need to be parents. Mom and dad need to be mom and dad. And one of the one of the things I think we have to think through as educators and educational leaders is as 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 we shift to remote learning um, or as we're in this remote learning situation that we can pro provide what kids need to continue their learning while not placing um, unrealistic and unfair expectations on parents who don't have the background or the training or the time if they're still working to become the child's teacher. That I believe has the possibility, if we, if we don't do that, we, that has the possibility of exacerbating the inequities that we see as well. Because the reality is Johnny could be going home to two parents that are college professors, uh, one who's a school teacher, and Maria could be going home um, to parents who um, don't, uh, don't have a high school education, right? And so if the expectation is that parent becomes teacher, you're making inequities even greater than what they are now. Great point. We have a great question. I love this one uh, from Dan G who asks, what's something you believe now about education that you didn't believe or realize before the crisis? This is a bit meta, I love it. Anyone want to take that one? Joanne? Oh. Wayne, we'll start with you. I am, I believe more so now that large scale change is on the horizon. Um, prior to um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, I, there were days just in being completely transparent where I, um, would find myself pretty frustrated in thinking about what the outlook would be in terms of making changes to our system that would benefit learning for kids. This is one of those moments, I believe, in the history of our nation um, where we are going to seize the opportunity to build in changes for the better and that we're gonna see, we're gonna see the results in, in our kids learning, particularly if we get this right, um, kids who have traditionally been underserved. Yeah, I would say I was always thinking about uh, what good instruction should look like uh, around strong content and, and how those things should be married in a physical setting. I think I now realize now that that can be translated to a virtual setting, not overnight, and it is it is challenging based on how we started, but you, you don't forget the strong practices that you did face to face, just because you moved to a remote setting, uh, you shouldn't be doing remote learning that is just transactional with no feedback, with no opportunity for engagement, you really have to be thoughtful about how you bring that content to life in the learning setting, just like you would um, in a physical setting. And so great teaching matters in either of the two settings. And you've got to create that alignment and pathway to those, again, built on strong content. Uh, great, we have a couple questions coming in, understandably about, you know, this need for differentiation and for individualizing the instruction, but also all of these other accommodations are going to have huge budget uh, price tags with it. And people are asking, you know, how should, how should they be thinking about budget and spending given uh, these new costs and given the uncertainties with declining state uh, tax revenue uh, and the uncertainties too of what Congress will do in terms of future relief packages? What, what advice would you have for schools that are, are trying to uh, rise up to meet some of those system changes that Wayne was just talking about, but also facing the reality of, of uncertain budgets. Anyone who wants to go? To the, to the budget conversation, the budget question, John, I, you know, we, the report is really clear, and I think we've all been really clear that this is going to take investment. Um, there's no way we're able to, to pull off what we're talking about without investment. And I would, I would go so far as to say really significant um, investment um, at the federal level and at the state level um, and at the local level for that matter. Um, with that said, I don't think districts and states are going to be able to think about, um, 
think about what we're talking about here in this transition to remote learning by just taking the additional costs and just putting everything on top of what we spend and what we do now. It's gonna require that I think we be more thoughtful about our practice and think about how our practice transforms, right? And, and this, this doesn't just become something else that we do or we do this in addition to everything else, but I, I think we're gonna to have to think about our system and think about how we fund the system um, and, and I mean, down to the, to the minute pieces, there's nothing that goes untouched here, whether it's personnel and specific positions, um, how we pay um, personnel, whether it's classified or certified, curriculum, um, instructional um, designers, uh, learning management systems, everything has to be on the table, but it's gonna, it's gonna take that type of approach where we truly look at the system, look at what it would mean to transform how we do this work and not just adding additional money onto what we do now. Great point. Yeah, and I would just add to what, uh, to what Wayne said, like this is gonna be one of the hardest problems and it's gonna be one of the problems that changes pretty rapidly over time. Cause as you said, John, we have no idea whether the, whether Congress is gonna have a stimulus that actually helps schools plug some of these gaps or not. There's just a lot of unknowns out there right now. But you know, to me, budgets are, are a reflection of our values. And we are gonna have to prioritize the inequities that I think this crisis has really laid bare in education and actually in, in all aspects of, of American life, to be honest, not just education, uh, but within our context, thinking through the priorities and making sure that we're putting our money where the needs are is gonna be top of mind. Yeah, I mean, this is the priority to get schools um, back in session around real learning, again, whether that's in a virtual setting or face to face should be job one of, of, of government, right, to make sure that kids are learning and that education has not stopped. And that's going to take investment at all levels, um, particularly, I think, from a state perspective, some states, I can't say many, but some states have been building up rainy day funds. This is the time to use those for educational purposes. This is the time to have an allocation that allows parents to actually go back to work as well and focusing directly on student learning at the same time. It really has a twofold purpose if we can invest in the right places and in the right ways. And the budgets don't need to be cut to such an extent that you can't continue to put in strong practices that states and local uh, groups were already moving forward on. That's the part that, that I struggle with is that we want to cut everything that were, uh, you know, on the, on the docket, if you will, um, in our budgets at this point, because now, you know what, we're going to have to hold on those for three or four years. But some of those may have been the very best things to move forward to make sure that we have the depth of student learning, better curriculum, better teaching, better assessments. Those things still need to move forward within the current environment and circumstances that we're in. And that will take investment at every level. And, and I hope to see more corporations step up as well as we've seen across the country. It's great We're We're almost at time here. So what I wanna do just to finish this up is just go around our, our panel and just what are your parting thoughts? What are your, your charge to the uh, education groups as they're trying to use these next four months to make sure we have uh, great schools ready for kids in the, uh, in the fall. So we'll start with Joanne, go to Candice and then with you, Wayne. Joanne? Yeah, I, I, I wanna say sort of echoing something that we talked about a little earlier, the, the blueprints are fabulous for helping us think of all the different categories and build a framework of the kinds of areas that we need to be thinking about going forward but the on the ground guidance, the actual like hands on, what do we do when, when schools reopen questions are very live and very real. And CCSSO is putting together some very detailed guidance to help districts and states with the academic issues of like social emotional learning integrated tightly with the academic core teaching and learning and wrapping around it, what it means for designing talent and uh, schedules that are useful in this kind of situation. So watch for some more detailed support to come out and know that, that that's the place we need to get over the next few months in order to really arm our educators with what they need to be successful when back to school starts. 
Great. Thank you, Joanne. Candice. Yeah, final word would be you're not alone. Uh, reach out to thought partners. Um, I, I love that Joanne mentioned CCSS, uh, organizations that are trying to get a, a bit more of a detailed uh, scenario planning guide for you. Uh, this starts that conversation. And I think what AEI has put out is such a great first step to creating those scenario plans that, that Wayne talked about earlier. So get with thought partners, work through what different options are, and then be prepared, be ready to staff for what those plans might look like. This might look like different ways that you organize teachers, different ways you use your paraprofessionals. It may alter job descriptions or new hires that you bring in, and it may elevate different types of teacher leaders in roles that you've wanted to do, and now this is the opportunity to do that. So create those scenarios, create thought partnership realities for um, moving this forward, and then be prepared and willing to make staffing changes to make next year successful. Thank you, Candice. Wayne. So we all know schools serve lots of different, incredibly important purposes, right? They employ lots of people. Um, they provide for livelihoods, for, for, for adults, for uh, they serve as community centers. Um, they provide safety and security for families and for kids. Uh, with that in mind, I think it's incredibly important that as we make critical decisions um, going forward, particularly now, that we always ensure that first and foremost, we're making decisions that are around doing what's best for students. All of those other purposes, those functions are incredibly important for us, for our families, for our communities. But if we put first and foremost students, their well-being and their learning, we tend to make different decisions. And so I would encourage us all to keep students at the center of all of our decision making. Such a great um, uh, end for the call today and a great charge for us, Wayne, a great reminder. Thank you. I am just uh, incredibly grateful for Joanne, Candice, and Wayne for uh, taking the time to join us today and offering their wisdom and experience. I'm also very grateful for just all the other uh, individuals that were part of this effort to develop this roadmap and just, uh, again, want to express our, our gratitude for that. I also want to give my appreciation for Brendan Bell, who was uh, our research assistant for Rick and I, who helped corral all the different comments together and, and helped marshal this report across the finish line. And then lastly, I'm just so grateful for everyone who's tuning in today. And just, uh, I know there's a lot of questions we weren't able to get to. Uh, they're all very important questions, but the spirit of this report was to help spark these questions, these discussions, and these debates. Uh, we have four months, and so we're hoping uh, that this starts a conversation and that we can start the new school year uh, even better than, uh, than school years in the past and just uh, look forward to working with everyone in partnership for that. So again, visit AI.org if you want to download the report uh, and look forward to working with you in the weeks and months ahead. So thanks, everyone.